a great tongue of land thrusting southward from Asia, India, richest jewel in the British crown, is a land of mystery and contrasts. Its people number nearly 400 million, a fifth of the world population. Three-fifths of India is British governed, the remainder divided into 562 principalities. They speak 220 distinct languages. Many are the strange sights of India. For India is the land where oxen, driven by children, draw water. Oxen blindfolded to keep them from knowing they're walking around in a circle all day long. This is the land where fine cloth is still woven by hand, where thread of gold and silver is woven into cloth, and where young boys do the finest sewing and embroidery. Their delicate and carefully trained hand create beauty and design in silk, in color. In this strange land, camels are bought and sold in the camel markets like any other merchandise. Here, merchants sit in the windows of their storefront shops making the goods they sell. Shoes with turned up pointed toes, sandals with soles made out of used American automobile tires. And so tread patterns, popular on American motor cars, mark the paths and trails of India. India is the land where barbers shave their customers' heads instead of their beards, with the advice of an appreciative audience. In another sidewalk shop, furniture makers turn table legs in primitive bowstring lathes guiding the chisel with their toes. This is craftsmanship of a high order, and apparently it has stirred the ambition of the younger generation to be a woodworker too. On the streets of Indian cities and towns, vendors sell sugar cane instead of candy, proving that the sweet tooth is universal, and proving too that the motto about sugar catching the most flies is true around the world. If they don't like sugar cane, the people can buy hamburgers prepared in the open air. They are really goat burgers, fried in cauldrons of boiling fat, made from goat meat, not from beef, which is none too plentiful here. And two, the people can walk from the street directly into the open air workshop of a coppersmith and have pots and pans made to order. Yes, all this is India. India, where some of the fiercest fighters of the Northwest are the most graceful dancers. boys of this Indian village leave their shoes outside the doors of the Mullah school, where the only textbook is the Quran, and boys learn it by heart by intoning the words aloud in unison with the teacher. India is the land of many religions where Mohammedans gather by the thousands outside the Juma Mosque in Delhi for evening prayer, where the Hindus worship by the sacred Ganges. For the Hindus believe that when a body is cremated on the banks of the Ganges, the smoke of the funeral pyre will bear their ascending souls straight to heaven, and that bathing in the sacred waters will infallibly wash away their sins. To the Hindus, the Ganges is more than a river. From the ice caves of the Himalayas, where it rises, to the Bay of Bengal, the Ganges is a symbol of Hindu faith. One of the most devout religious sects is the Jains, a people who believe it is a sin to take the life of any living thing, even an insect. 
Every 15 years, the Jains assemble by hundreds of thousands for a great religious ceremony, which takes place on the top of a mountain approached by 500 steps. On the summit of the mountain stands the object of their homage, towering overhead like a colossus, the statue of the giant saint, Domata, surrounded by a scaffold from which a thousand priests anoint the image, dominating the mountain and the plain below. For 950 years, the giant statue has impassively watched his myriad followers as they place at his feet offerings of milk, coconuts, sandalwood oil, flowers, fruit, dates, and poppy seeds. Yes, this empire within an empire is a country of idols, of demons carved in stone, of animals worshipped like gods. All this is India. But along with all this, it is an empire of powerful princes for whom Golconda Fort once guarded the fabulous diamond mines, for whom Jodhpur Fort was built to dominate the city below a fort with special quarters for the women where they could look out unseen through ornate screens of carbon stone. A fort where even now a noon gun is fired every day. In contrast to the guns and forts are the gardens known around the world, such as the Shalimar Gardens. of monuments of unparalleled magnificence, such as this tomb built by the great Mughal Shah Jahan to commemorate his bride. In all the world, no memorial is better known than this architectural masterpiece of delicate embroidery in marble, a great ruler's tribute to his loved one, the Taj Mahal. Scattered across the country are incredible palaces, breathtaking reception halls, like this hall of private audience of the same ruler Shah Jahan who built the Taj Mahal. Palaces that are still a byword for splendor and ornate display. In these Indian states governed by their own princes, Display and magnificence mark the ceremonial life as well as the monuments. This is the birthday durbar, the birthday celebration of the Maharaja of Patiala, a powerful Indian prince of the Punjab. In sheer possessions accumulated over the centuries by their families, these rulers, like the Maharaja of Patiala, may surpass the wealthiest men on earth. As an example of this wealth, around his highness neck are thousands of carats of the Patiala diamonds, a king's ransom in sparkling gems. Yes, all this is India. Here is still another India. The India of the military display of the Maharaja of Bikaner's household troops. All this display is part of the festivities which accompany the wedding of the Maharaja of Bikaner's granddaughter to the heir apparent of Udaipur.
some of the wedding gifts fairly stagger the imagination. They include embroidered camels, horses decked with solid silver trappings, carriages made of solid gold, decorated elephants, a Chevrolet bus designed for the household transportation service, a motor car especially fitted out for hunting expeditions, and two Cadillacs for just riding around. An Indian state wedding is a stupendous extravaganza. Few other spectacles on earth can equal such a wedding for pomp or brilliance, and the opportunity to see such a celebration is a privilege offered rarely, if ever, to any but a favored few. Every official and dignitary is garbed in flamboyant color that outdoes the rainbow. And the procession to the palace is like a chapter from the Arabian Nights. Yet, in all the amazing parade of kaleidoscopic pageantry, the bridegroom is seen alone, without his bride. She is kept in seclusion, out of sight. No men, even invited guests except members of the immediate family, are permitted to see the bride before or during the ceremonies. Instead, while the actual wedding takes place inside the palace, the guests are entertained by a display of Indian playing and dancing. The festivities continue for days, concluding with a state banquet on service of solid gold for 300 guests, including the greatest ruling princes of India. Yes, this too is India, the lavishness and splendor of the official life of the Indian rulers, inheritors of the wealth that made this land the treasure house of the ancient world and the final objective of every great conqueror. And here is the end of our voyage into the past. The motor caravan has taken us to the goal of our journey, the land where in bygone days, the caravan started with their loads of gold and jewels, rich fabrics, spices and dyes, the land of teeming millions whose lives and labors, ways and worship, together make the magnificence and mystery we know as India.